I was raised evangelical Christian, and I had a lot of problems with it, and then I made a sort of loose step to transition into Orthodox Judaism, and had like a really good foundation with Chabad and in Chassidus and such. And I spoke about it with some other people about how I had a very Christian-centric view of Judaism, and it wasn't until I met a Chabad Shliach who did a lot of seating activity that I really started understanding Judaism as a whole. So what did you, what did you come to understand? What is, what is a Christianized Judaism and what is not? <laughs> um, a Christianized Judaism is more along the lines of really, of kind of giving up on Torah and mitzvahs. And it was just a lot of replacing that with, with, um, somebody else who, who took care of all of those things and um, a big problem I had in Christianity was if, if we claim that Christianity comes from Judaism why is it that we're so far removed from it? Why is it we do nothing like the Jews? Why is it we claim to have all the answers that they didn't have? So and I, I had no answers to that question until I met I f it was the first rabbi I ever met who was able to answer some of those questions. So what, what clicked for you? What did you hear that convinced you? So there were a Christian understanding is that their Messiah, um, they like the Jesus as they call him, that he um, that he was God. I had a huge problem with that, and that he was the Messiah, and I didn't understand them to be the same thing, and it didn't make sense to me that that was the case, and it wasn't until I had a good introduction to Judaism that that was clarified. And then that truly, it was, it seems, it was groundbreaking for me that, that the Messiah isn't supposed to be God. And that, that really threw me for a loop. And so that was kind of a really clarifying moment there. And then based on that very simple understanding, all of the other understandings that go along with it came also. It, two two interesting um, considerations about Christianity. The first thing is, how did it get started? It started with Jews. How do you come to people who are keeping 613 commandments and convince them not to? How do you do that? And it caught on pretty quickly. The way they did it was very simple. You set up a false premise, and then you shoot it down. So you come to a Jew and you say, you know how you need 613 mitzvahs to get to heaven? Well, not anymore. What a deal. But it's a false premise. Who said you need 613 mitzvahs to get to heaven? It was never about getting to heaven. 613 mitzvahs that serve God's purpose. How can that change? God changed? So if you were to come to a Jew and say, you know how you do 613 things that God really expects from you? Well, he doesn't expect it anymore. Oh, well, that's not good news. That would never catch on. Right? So if the mitzvah is what God needs and we're serving him, don't tell me I can't serve him anymore. That's not good news. So they set up a false premise. The only reason you're doing these mitzvahs is to get to heaven. Well, I can get you in for free. That's irresistible. <laughs> so that's number one. That the way Christianity starts is by first saying, this is not for God, this is for you. Well, I can get you a better deal. second thing is, which is really amazing, everything they say about him is absolutely true. He is God's child. He is not born of sin. He is born of God. He is the Messiah. He is the suffering servant. It's all true. It's also true of every other Jew in the world. <laughs> Why they pick on him? I don't know. So you see, the reason it lasted as long as it has is because of that kernel of truth. 
Without a little kernel of truth, a falsity doesn't work. So what is true? What's true is the Jews are God's suffering servant. The Jews are God's child, born of God, little piece of God that is the Jewish soul. Uh, we are the Messiah. We're the light to the nations. It's all true. So actually, everything you've taught, every, every, everything they taught you, and everything, yeah, pretty good. Just apply it properly. <laughs> when Mel Gibson made his movie of uh, suffering, <gasps> he suffered so much. Oh, give me a break. He suffered for one day. Jews have suffered for two thousand years. So if anybody is God's suffering <laughs> servant. <laughs> So, it's not all wrong, it's just applied in a pro, you know, out of proportion or whatever. So, Moshiach is not God and God is not Moshiach. What is Moshiach? In your new vision. In my new vision? Mashiach, it's kind of the, it's the, it is, Mashiach is the deliverance from Gula, or it is, it is the, the um, bringing out of, of the diaspora and of bringing home everyone and, and reconnecting truly Hashem with the world in that final sort of stage. We work so hard to do the mitzvahs, to bring more light into the world, to make a, a living place for God in this world. And Mashiach is when that job is, I don't want to say it, like completely, it is more on the accomplished sort of things, where things finally come together, and everything finally is at peace, and the world is finally whole again. So we can't just wait for Mashiach. Sure. We have to make it. So it's really not even correct to say Mashiach will come not going to come if you don't do anything. Mashiach is coming because we're doing what we need to do. So the right way to say it is Mashiach is coming, not he will come. It's not a prediction. It's a, it's a project, a long-standing project. So how can we be sure that Mashiach will come? We're not predicting the future. We're sure that he's coming because we're preparing the way. On the other hand, if we prepare the way, what do we need him for? In other words, if we can fix the world so that he can come, what's he coming for? So I, th I think you were, you were being careful about, you know, we're doing all the work because then, <laughs> then, then it sounds like we don't need him. Yeah. So we're doing uh, some of the work and he'll finish it. The finishing touch or the final or whatever. It doesn't have to be that way. We can make the world completely, perfectly godly and we still need him. And then we will really need him. Because how do you function in a godly world? We don't know. We know how to function in a world that needs fixing. What happens when it gets fixed? We're going to need somebody to teach us a whole new way to live. To get excited and wake up in the morning and there's nothing to fix. How's that going to feel? How's that going to work? So we need a new teacher, a great new teacher who will introduce a whole new way of serving God, a whole new way of doing mitzvahs, because it's going to be a different world. So it's not enough to say, it's an error. Something will happen in, in the world, something will happen to mankind, and it'll all be good. So what do you need an individual Mashiach? So really, the primary role of Mashiach is a teacher, not a savior. Because really, we should save ourselves. That would be much better. 
But if we do save ourselves, we're not going to know how to function after that. It's like, once I get over my psychosis, how, how do you be normal? <laughs> I know how to fight psychosis. I don't know how to be normal. So I'm going to need a whole new teacher, a whole new way of life. And that's what Mashiach is really. And that's what the new revelation is about. It's not a new testament. The new revelation is, if the job gets done, and now we have a perfect condition in the world, what will serving God mean then? Same mitzvahs, but different challenge, different inspiration. So what's going to make it exciting if we're not fi fighting and trying to overcome our evil inclination? Because there won't be one. So what's going to be exciting about doing mitzvahs? That's what Mashiach has to teach us. So God we have all the time. His mitzvahs we have all the time. Mashiach is something different in addition. Mashiach is the inspiration behind mitzvahs when the world is perfect. Because some people are really worried about it. <laughs> what do you mean the world's going to be perfect? What are we going to do? It'll be so boring. That's like people who date. They're constantly dating. So why don't they get married? What do you mean? Get married and then, what, never date again? <laughs> That's scary. They're good at dating. They don't know how to be married. And the more you date, the worse it gets. Because you get better at dating. And then get married? What's going to happen to the dating? <laughs> It'll be over. Well, that doesn't sound so good. So now we have to have a whole new education, how to be married. Because it's not the same as dating. So until Mashiach comes, we're dating, we're working on a relationship. And it's exciting, challenging, frustrating. But then we'll arrive. What will we do then? Just be married? <laughs> Sounds really flat. So that's why we need Mashiach. So to say, he suffered, he, he'll get you into heaven. Come on, what are you talking about? We don't need that. That's not what Mashiach is about. kind of a feminine development because women are much better at celebrating what is rather than celebrating what can be. Men love what can be. You know, we want to challenge, we want to change something, prove something, fight a battle, overcome. In other words, we, we like getting there more than we like being there. Women like being there. So Mashiach is more like a feminine world where we're going to have to learn how to get excited about things that are already good. So what's the excitement? Oh, it's good. Yeah, but it's already good. See? So the masculine mind finds it a little hard to... Uh, that's why the feminine will be more prominent than the masculine. As long as there are dragons to slay and giants to kill, the male is dominant, prominent. Once that's over, we're going to need Mashiach to teach us how to get excited about things that are already just perfect. So you're going back to yeshiva? Thinking pretty strongly about it. <laughs>
when I went to visit NYU, as I said, it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like it was where I should be. And the time I spent in yeshiva when I was in Israel was just amazing. It felt I felt connected for the first time in a very long time. So seems like a good good route. Should have a lot of success. You need to go to NYU to have a handle on how to live. You need to go to yeshiva to figure out why. Why you should live and why you should have a good life and why you should have a handle on how to live. Because without the yeshiva, the rest is not justified. So it's a good move. Hearing that God is vulnerable, is that spoken about, or is like it's not um, for God to be vulnerable doesn't really make sense necessarily for the Christian mind. It has to do more. I mean, He's all powerful, and really, the the move for a Christian is to get yourself like it. In, in that mind of salvation and really working towards towards getting yourself to where you need to be and it has less to do with with God's actions I mean the, the requirement is that he would have mercy on you and so that you would be able to make it to to where he is so I mean it's really not it's really nothing to do with him being vulnerable or him really needing much from you which is another really big part of especially Judaism. You like, I, I heard it once that not only does a Jewish man wrap the fill in, but God wraps the fill in, in in reference to us, in reference to the Jewish man. In that there's really, it's very, it's so much more. I think like a, a space of like, co, there's both both on both ends. There's more happening. Christianity, it's really all about you trying to get yourself out of harm's way. And he truly, he's there to get you out of harm's way, but beyond that, it doesn't really feel like there's much more that he's responsible for, as far as that goes, if that sounds right. And I'm sure plenty of Christians would disagree with me. But I'm sitting here and they're not, you know? Well, there's there's the the movement from higher to lower, and there's the movement from lower to higher. God created the world. Obviously, the direction is from above down. Religion kind of introduces the opposite. We got to get ourselves up. So God wants heaven on earth. We want earth on heaven, in heaven. Right? We want rewards in heaven. What kind of rewards? Human things. Which is ridiculous. Right? So religion is trying to elevate the world back to God, which is a good thing. But Judaism is helping God get comfortable in the world or making the world comfortable for him. So we're bringing him down, not raising ourselves up. And that way we stay away from narcissism and self-righteousness. And it's not about me. The reason I do the mitzvahs is because God is trying to get here. Well, we've got to welcome him. So it's more God-centered than religion. Religion is self-centered. What can I get from God? What can he do for me? And why isn't he doing more? <laughs> He's never doing enough.
So it becomes really self-centered and self-focused. And also, it becomes a, a it, it, it leaves you with a bad taste. Uh, about Earth. Earth is not the place to be. You've got to get to heaven. That's not good for Earth. This um, religious school, I forget which denomination, St. Catherine's maybe? Anyway, so uh, two students were, were given a project to interview people in the community who are doing something to improve the world. You know, fighting cancer, environmentalists, whatever, whoever. Everyone is trying to improve the world. So he came to Chabad House, two students. Very official, very clipboards, and they're asking questions. And I said, how many institutions or movements have you already interviewed? They said, nine. I said, nine, nine groups, nine institutions fixing the world? So is the world any better? And they, all, and they, they cracked up. I, I said, how come? If all these people are working and making the world better, why isn't it getting better? So one of them said, see, that's why it's so good to know that there's a better world waiting. I said, isn't that why this one is not getting better? If you're convinced that there's a better world waiting, how hard are you going to work on this one? It's bad news. So religion has kind of parted ways with God's purpose. God is trying to come down, religion is trying to go up. They're not always compatible. So that's why Hasidus, more than anything else, emphasizes God's pursuit. What is God after, not what we're after? which makes God vulnerable, puts him in the vulnerable position. Will his vast eternal plan be realized? So you stop a guy in the street and you say, can you put on film for a minute? What are you trying to accomplish? He's not going to get to heaven for putting on film once. He's not going to be among the saints when they come marching in. <laughs> so what is the purpose? The main purpose is, for that moment, God is getting what he needs. Is that not infinitely valuable? So pick the right yeshiva, too. Don't just go to any yeshiva.